Next, we have Jeff Flowers. Uh, <laughs> Je Jeff has done many things. Uh, he's a professor uh, in his daytime. Uh, he's been re really active in the community since, since when? 2013, 20, 2013. Um, and he also was leading uh, the curriculum development over at Blockchain University. And he's involved in so many projects right now. So here you go, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome. This is going to be quite fun. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of uh, fun with this. So if there's any questions, please stop me and say, hey, uh, let's talk more about that. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick note of the time. Just want to make sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about crypto economics and tokenomics 101. Uh, this was not my first choice of titles. I thought, you know, wouldn't it be fun, uh, a little bit better if... Uh, It'd be quite fun to have tokens, tokens, everyone gets a token, tokens, but we'll, we'll try to keep it a little bit highbrow. All right, so I always like to start any slide with a, a, a quote, uh, something to set the stage. I, you know, for this one, this one just came to me, and, and I hope to share why later. Um, I also used quotes, um, back in the day, we used to use quotes on uh, our slides with which just a version control everything. But I thought this one's quite funny. You can't cut back for funny, you'll regret this, Sin City Advisor. And we'll, we'll see how this quote all ties in with uh, today's uh, talk about tokens. So, you know, this idea of crypto economics, um, one, it's been around, or rather it's, it's an emerging field, but it's been around for some time since the beginning of this field. And it doesn't have to be this highbrow, complex idea. I mean, people were talking about this and just having fun with it. Uh, back, th this was 2015, um, and it was Crypto Economicon, you know, 1.0, in which people said, hey, with this new idea called blockchain, maybe we could actually bootstrap economies. And this was the beginning to this whole idea of, well, what can we do with this technology? Um, well, <laughs> all right, so it's kind of hard to see, but I was hoping to end... Um, uh, well, let's just get, well, so the, the overview for today, uh, for this uh, lecture, uh, we'll just talk about background, explain what tokenization is, what are tokens, um, crypto economics, throw that in, and I was hoping to end uh, with a lab. Uh, maybe we could demystify this by just rolling our own tokens and deploying on a network and seeing just how easy it is to actually create an idea, create a token, and deploy immediately. So a little bit about me, um, I, I will, I'll go a little bit quicker, but yes, um, my, my day job, if you will, is um, uh, I teach chemistry of all things at, at uh, uh, College of San Mateo. Um, I also uh, uh, taught blockchain at a blockchain university and DLT education and elsewhere, and, and advised a number of different um, companies in the area. Uh, some of the more interesting ones, I think, are around security and doing formal verification, uh, amongst other things. But uh, so first off, by show of hands, you know, if I were to ask, well, what's the definition, what's the difference between a, a coin and a token? I mean, how many here would say, hey, you really feel comfortable with the distinction between these two uh, words? Um, perfect. The, the, you know, it's one of those things where I thought we'd start off with some definitions, figure out what is this, and, and also, you know, share some of the history. This is David Chom. Um, uh, basically um, came up with the idea of microtransactions or micropayments back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, um, with his paper of, uh, on blind signatures in 1987, I think, or 9, and his DigiCash uh, company in the early 90s uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, so this idea of creating, if you will, currency to perform actions like this is nothing new. Uh, in fact, for some people, uh, this is why we pretty much discounted uh, Bitcoin when it first came out because it's a really hard problem. People have been working on it for decades, um, and so, oops. So coins, you know, let's just unpack this and see what is a coin, what is a token, and, and what does it all mean? So I love this quote from uh, Dr. Shapiro, and, and, and again, I'm going to be using Bitcoin, but we can talk about any native coin on any platform. This was just a quote from a couple years back. Uh, before, if you will, multiple blockchains and multiple projects started taking hold. But if you think about what is the, the, the object of a coin, it is 
in effect to power your ability to operate and use a particular platform to do a function, just to do work. Um, when people understand that, it becomes to make a lot more sense. Um, you go, oh, it's not actually intrinsically a currency, but rather the possibility or the privilege to use that technology. Um, whereas when we talk about tokens, um, well, tokens are built on top of a platform. And in essence, these allow people who create these objects uh, to give them different uh, properties and, and privileges and access control. And, and I love the, you know, this is something in my generation we totally got uh, because I grew up with Chuck E. Cheese and using tokens. <laughs> you go in, <laughs> you, you want to run a program? Great, it's going to cost a token. <laughs> it was really easy. If you want to play Defender, you're plucking in a coin from Chuck E. Cheese to run that program. Same idea. But they're effectively just a data object that allows you access to some sort of subset of privileges of the creator's choosing. Um, and really, if you really want to understand the origins of this, uh, just talking about uh, uh, Bitcoin Magazine and the idea of colored coins, this basically started the idea that maybe we could take these cryptocurrencies, these coins, specifically Bitcoin, what if instead of us using them to, for access control or privileges on top of a platform, what if we could basically give them metadata and say that cryptocurrency, that Bitcoin, which at the time was worth nothing, is now a share of stock. And this began this idea. Of course, you might realize the big problem with that is, well, Bitcoin went up in value quite a bit. And so unless your stock also had uh, a huge rise, this could be a problem. And also, there is no way to standardize this. So there were some problems that needed to be worked out. And I, and I think people have been working these out. Now, economies, this one, oh boy, I, I didn't know how to define this one. I thought management of resources, but you know, I thought, why are we really here? You know, what, what's the purpose of this? And, and you know, I, I thought, well, it, it's just for Lambos, right? I mean, <laughs> that's the point of this, <laughs> to understand this technology specifically. And you know, I, I, I love this, and it's just one of those funny, you know, pictures. Um, that we all chuckle at and, and people talked about a couple years back and, and up until now. But, but in reality, I think what happened to a lot of people who took this idea is they, they didn't get their Lambos, it kind of went the other way. So I think though, if we understand the technology, Lambos maybe will come your way, but you'll have a greater appreciation of how to actually use this technology for something interesting. Because companies are interested in this, Organizations that are meaningful are interested in this technology. People are talking about this. This was taken just yesterday out of Forbes. A lot of, a lot of businesses that uh, are not into collecting Lambos are looking at tokenization, are trying to understand how they can leverage this technology for existing business systems. Um, and so this idea is being seriously discussed and seriously explored. Um, so getting a better feel for what is uh, tokenization, what are tokens and how do they behave uh, is really quite interesting. Um, this is not, oh by the way, so this talk we're not going to talk about any of the nuances behind, you know, uh, an ICO, an STO, uh, you know, how you, the difference between a utility token or a security token or any of the legal mumbo jumbo, the use of Howey test, none of that. That, that. I think that's outside the scope. That's, that's and, and anyone, by the way, who says that they understand that is probably lying. Uh, it, this is way too new, really, to fully understand, and, and we're just going to be looking at what are these objects and, and how do they fit within this other schema that we call an economy that we already kind of know. It's hard to define, but we kind of know. So what are some of the goals of tokenization? You know, let's be serious and let's be honest. You know, a lot of people will say it's about uh, using a certain type of um, blockchain or subset of uh, functionalities within a blockchain i.e. it's a utility token, but people are using these, let's be real, uh, as a funding source. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if, if we think about it, it basically allows access to resources and capital that at a, a lower cost to entry, which a lot of people have a great idea or have an interesting novel business concept, uh, but to raise would otherwise be somewhat cost prohibitive using t current tools. Um, so again, it's the bootstrapping of ideas. Oh, I, I forgot also governance. 
One, utility, or one use of uh, 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 tokens, which I think really is quite interesting, is novel forms of governance uh, we're seeing, um, whereby you could use these uh, uh, tokens with which to perform functions such as voting, arriving at consensus, understanding you know, outcomes on business logic. This deviates a bit from, for example, let's say coins, in which a consensus algorithm by and large, by every blockchain out there um, that, well, not all, but most, arrive at consensus via deterministic means. You could have a governance-based consensus algorithm, which is quite interesting. Um, and basically, it allows people to experiment, which I think is a really interesting uh, outcome. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be quite interesting to uh, look at this in the view of a historical lens, and just by, but just by happenstance the other night, uh, I was watching on Netflix uh, the world's busiest cities, and I was watching Hong Kong, and I thought, wow, this is quite interesting. You know, they were looking at Hong Kong, and you know, they were talking about the history of it, uh, of this uh, amazing city, and they were saying, you know, when it was a, a free port, they realized they didn't have a bank, and this was uh, uh, really impeding their ability to do business because it took so long for them to arrive at and to perform business functions. And they thought we should build our own bank. And of course that would become HSBC. And, and what was so interesting to me was the ledgers that they kept in their vaults showcasing what people back in the 1800s was, were doing. And I thought, well, this is what we're doing today. But we have a new free port called the internet. And this is interesting because we're, we have this new frontier, if you will, and people are realizing that information's been opened up in historical, uh, in historic new ways. Um, and our interactions and engagements within this environment are expanding. And I think when people look back in 100 years, they're going to suggest or, or see that the advent of the internet and blockchains occurred at the same time. If you will, blockchains is simply a new protocol stack. It is the protocol of money. And we did not define money because that's very complex, I'm gonna be honest. Um, but it's just a new protocol. It's just a new stack of communication. So what can we do with these you know, token-based systems? And why, why do you even want to put business logic on blockchains? Or what's the whole point of blockchains in business, should they even mix with one another? And to understand that, I think we have to understand what is a blockchain. Um, well, first off, the name sort of gives it away, right? It's, it's a chain of blocks. And, and I'm really going at a high level. We're not diving deep within the data structures that are both blocks and the transactions within the blocks. But we could think of it as we have this chain of blocks they contain objects we're going to call transactions data. And we're going to say, well, you know what? The state of this blockchain is maintained by the peers of the network. And why is this important or why is this interesting? Well, this is how we basically perform security on the state by allowing these individual nodes to understand what actually is happening to that blockchain at any given time. And so, we, we arrive at the security through this idea of a consensus algorithm. There are many out there. Um, I'm sure we've heard of proof of work. Uh, uh, people have you know, given this somewhat of a bad rap lately due to energy considerations. But I would argue for a lot of blockchains, this is probably the only consensus algorithm that makes sense. I know there's various hybrid models out there, proof of stake. There is no pure proof of stake, I would argue. There's, but multiple hybrids of um, proof of capacity is a very interesting uh, consensus algorithm, I, I must admit. I, I find myself being drawn to that one more and more uh, just because it's so interesting. Um, but we're able to secure this blockchain using consensus algorithm in which everyone agrees upon how these transactions and how these blocks will be created and formed. Now the interesting bit right here I think is this idea of the clock is always advancing. So we're always advancing the state of the blockchain. Now I'll come back and we'll, we'll see why that's so important. And of, of course, where do tokens fit in on all this? Well, tokens are simply a data object that fit within the schema of these other transactional data sets. Oh, and I should say, you know, they themselves can have within them predefined access controls and privileges. 
So what is a token? What is a data? What, what, what is this? And, and to this, we're going to have to define a term called a smart contract. And, and there's nothing smart about them. They're just simply programs. And very small programs, we'll see. Um, but nonetheless, you'll, you'll see this term come up again and again and again, smart contracts. And you might think it's like a smart car. Well, maybe it is. They're very small. Um, but in essence, it's a program in which the execution is going to take place on blockchain. And we could see them as having these well-formed code snippets, programs, whatever, that will do certain functions and, and only those functions. And there are, in fact, many types of these programs or smart contracts. Um, you've probably have heard of or have heard about this idea of an ERC-20 token. I was thinking at the end, at the uh, uh, lab practicum, we'll actually deploy an ERC-20 token ourselves and see how quickly we can do it. So yeah, oh, actually, I should have said, if you have a laptop, if you want to follow along, we could do that. But there are so many different types of tokens. We'll see where we could see where this, uh, if you will, this uh, menagerie of tokens are located. But we'll look at two types, generically speaking. The two types I think everyone has heard about or at least heard some instance of. Uh, we'll talk about those that are fungible and those that are non-fungible. Uh, the the non-fungible tokens, all that means is if I have one quarter and I had another quarter, they're worth exactly the same. There's no distinction or difference between a quarter. They will allow you to do whatever one quarter will allow you to do, which today I think is nothing, but perhaps you could have done something with it. It's, they're the exact same object regardless. However, your cat, if you have a cat, if you have a dog, you have a dog, but your cat is unique to yourself. It, it, they, one cat is not the same as another cat. And, and I picked this idea because CryptoKitties was one of the first instances of what's known, generically speaking, as a non-fungible token, an NFT. And this actually was interesting because the creators of this game, if you will, uh, in essence were able to bring down one of the largest blockchains down to its knees quite by accident by deploying a game with this new object called a non-fungible token, which represented a cat. And by doing so, November 2017, I guess, the Ethereum network suffered a cataclysmic event in which transactions were at a grinding halt for quite a while, which was un unintended. So we have different types of tokens. Those are fungible, those are non-fungible, but there are many other types. And you'll be hearing more about these in the future, I'm sure, as securitization and security tokens become more and more of a thing once they become if they become legalized. So where do you find all these different types of tokens? And for those of you looking for a project or looking for something to do, this is where it gets interesting. The whole concept of CryptoKitties was born out of th that team looking through these Ethereum improvement protocol, or I'm sorry, proposals, and they saw a, 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 a proposal written in plain language, plain you know, what, what, what the goal would be, how it might work, but zero code. And they decided to take that one, which happened to be, uh, um, I guess, EIP-721, and they were to take that idea and then encode it, actually write the code to make it real. You can go right now to EIPS and read through all these plain, the, these, these ideas that are written out very plainly, very cleanly, that have uh, possibly no code behind them. And you too can say, hey, this sounds like an interesting idea. Maybe I could do something with that. If you thought that you know, building a game of non-fungible tokens in which the tokens are themselves cats would be a, a killer application, no one saw that one coming. So you never know what gems are in the rough here. But nonetheless, you can go there and see what other token ideas are out there. Uh, I said that these smart contracts are themselves quite small. Uh, here is a... Uh, 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 a token uh, contract for ERC-20. Uh, this is the fungible token that we hear a lot about. Um, and we see that, in essence, it is effectively less than 200 lines of code. I mean, that's very doable. And by the way, most of this is just comments. 
Uh, the reason why I bring this up is I think one of the things that people think about in this space is, wow, the, this code must be really difficult to read or very difficult to look at, very difficult to uh, implement. That's actually nothing could be further from the truth. The more complex your code is in this space, the more probability of an error or a, an issue. So smaller is so much better. Okay, so let's get back to uh, trying to figure out what is the, 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 the business aspect to all this. So we know that blockchain platforms, and, and I'll use the term platforms and blockchains interchangeably, uh, they have some very unique properties which are quite interesting. The first one being this idea of execution guarantees, that you, the clock is always ticking. And so why would you even consider putting your business on a blockchain? Why not use a centralized service? Now, I know a lot of people like, uh, you know, Jimmy Song is out there saying that every Every company that does a decentralized uh, app is better served to, using a centralized service. And, and to, a lot of ex to a great extent, he is correct. However, the reason why you'd want to dap is if your service or your, your application or your business cannot tolerate downtime. This is where uh, a decentralized or blockchain-based uh, idea really excels because the clock is always advancing. And you can also have advanced access controls. That's just a fancy way to say you have cryptographic primitives and access to those cryptographic primitives. If you use a permissionless system, now this, of course, doesn't apply if you use a permission system, of which there are many. Um, but if you use a permissionless system, then you have complete and open access. You don't have to worry about, well, you know, I'm not authorized to access that. A permissionless platform allows anyone, anywhere, as long as they can get access to the network, can have access to that. That's quite interesting. It means that you don't have to worry about your locale or jurisdiction. Just because you were born in a certain area of the world doesn't mean that you're excluded from access. It's quite nice. And you also know that as long as your transaction behaves and is well formed, that is to say that it is what the network expects, you will get that transaction executed or, if you will, you will achieve finalization of that transaction at some set time. It's, it might be probabilistic in nature, but you know that it will occur. So you know that just because you put in, you know, uh, your request, that will happen. And so you can tell, you can, you can kind of see where this is going. I mean, a marketplace with all these business-friendly attributes is quite interesting. There's, there is quite a lore for that, and hence why people are talking about tokenization and putting tokens and using tokens but there are some pitfalls. <laughs> and and I, I saw this, this was, um, I, I think we were talking uh, uh, just earlier about uh, uh, security and we were talking about uh, TLS and SSL and I was thinking about a friend of mine, uh, this uh, fellow, Christopher, he was talking the other day on Twitter about systems level thinking, the lack thereof, people aren't thinking in systems and, and, and we'll get to that in a second because oftentimes people think, hey, I have a great platform and my code is great, but that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough. Um, because many of these business systems are improperly or incompletely or just plain not modeled correctly, that they're not understanding how these interactions between different actions and activities interact with one another. And, and, and basically, this lack of rigor in understanding <laughs> Uh, of how tokens will actually be used within the system and for what ends and how they'll behave leads to unsustainable outcomes. And you know a, a project has some issues if they have emission control or lack thereof. If you have projects that say, well, you know, we're going to make a billion tokens or 38 billion tokens. Who, had, who, who came out with 38 billion tokens for their project? Anyone remember this one? You probably do. I mean, this is why everyone I remember back in the day, we all thought, oh, that's a pre-mine mm. ripple. They thought, we're just going to make 38 billion of them. I don't know. Maybe that's enough. Um, one idea is just make so many tokens, you'll never run out of them, and then maybe you can always use them. Or some just say, hey, we're going to have just uh, inflation. Just build that right in, and that'll help keep the systems running. Now, the reason why I brought this, this picture up is this whole idea of, uh, of linear algebra, Markovnikov chains, and understanding like processes, but this doesn't really say the story. I mean, we know this, at least I think we all do. I, I, knew, I, I learned this back in the day when I first played SimCity, and I thought, oh boy, 
how can I, I mean, I mean, that's rough. That's hard to get. I mean, that takes a long time to get there. I mean, you really have to really work on this. Or you just type in the cheat code and get infinite money. But again, I'm saying that a lot of systems, a lot of projects have not done the work, haven't figured out all the interconnections and the interconnectivities, and so they have typed in God mode and just said, we're going to have infinite number of tokens. So it's something that I don't think people really come to understand or, or grasp yet, how to model these properly. And the, the tools are rudimentary at best. All right, so back to, back to uh, business systems. But now you see where the, uh, the quote for the, uh, the SimCity advisor plays in. All right, so hopefully I've impressed upon you the reason why you want to even consider using a blockchain for this thing that we're going to call a token is we can encode within this token certain business-friendly attributes or business operations like governance, uh, you know, uh, access control, privileges, et cetera. We've put it on a blockchain because blockchains have unique properties that are interesting, guaranteed execution, access control, cryptographic primitive access uh, of, um, and also the ability to access regardless of your jurisdiction. So, but there are some pitfalls. You really have to think about what you're trying to accomplish and how to model that properly. So, again, why would you even tokenize in the first place? Basically, if it's a cost effect, it's a cost effective tool for many teams out there that don't have the capital with which to go the traditional routes and, and capture funds uh, um, via other means. Uh, through venture capital or raising uh, other routes. Uh, now we've learned of a, a new way to, uh, to get that help. And, uh, uh, you know, again, the whole idea behind this is just try a cost effectiveness. Ooh, better get over here. <laughs> All right, though, but again, too often, too little thinking is taking place on the, the complexity of these interactions, or it is just realized the problem is way too complex. And one of the turnoffs initially, I think, for a lot of people, even myself, uh, about the Ethereum project was they baked into the protocol inflation. And at the time, it was thought to be sloppy. But they just realized it was just too complex to understand how to model this properly. So there is something to be said about maybe having certain wiggle room within how your tokens are constructed. And, and also, you know, you must you must always be able to, you know, explain both the business, you know, framework um, for having a token, both in terms of financially as well as legally. Just because you can create a token, which we'll do right now, or we'll do real soon, just because you can create a token doesn't mean you have a business. So, but let's talk about before we do that this whole idea of crypto economics. So. We, we see tokenization is becoming more intriguing. Businesses, real businesses, are thinking about how they can tokenize uh, uh, various uh, objects and business units. Um, and we see some of the pitfalls. But let's talk about crypto economics. So what is crypto economics? I mean, this is one of those words which you see, and it sounds really good on paper. But what does it mean? All it means is it's just a, a marriage or a merging of cryptographic tools like the ones that power blockchains uh, with economic incentives. So I hope I've impressed upon you this idea of economic incentives and the, the need to really unpack this and understand what are the incentives, how do these different players and these dif different business op you know, aspects interact with one another, and how can you incentivize the entire system with which to achieve the end goal that you want. Uh, you know, some of the other cryptographic tools because we have access to uh, cryptographic primitives, um, actually, before we talk about this one, uh, cryptographic tools, uh, uh, I remember this, uh, uh, a friend of mine was saying, you know, even if blockchains go away in a couple of years, if it, it was all a terrible mistake, at least developers today will have a better understanding of cryptographic primitives in their code, and maybe we can use them for something else. But I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. But, but we can use these cryptographic primitives to secure business processes and, and business work. Uh, but again, the act of fostering engagement between players and, and between participants and, and parties, that is uh, something I think a lot of people 
really don't put enough time or thought in. And, and oftentimes people will just talk about game theory and whatnot. And you notice I didn't really talk about game theory until just now. And it, because I would argue that's not even, that's not really a math. That's just, that's just trying to understand, you know, how do these systems interact with one another? If anyone ever starts talking about game theory, just to ask, well, what's a Nash equilibrium? What's a shelling point? And that, that'll, you'll know right away whether or not they just saw the movie or they actually did some math. <laughs> uh, because again, oftentimes, you know, all these systems are great. You can have the best tools in the world. If you don't know how to use them, you don't know how to use them. And so you could have, you know, broken up tools, as long as you know what you're doing with them, you can build whatever you want. So again, this term cryptoeconomics is basically just a merger of cryptographic tools that power blockchains, this idea of these cryptographic primitives, and this idea of a blockchain that's ever advancing, and the ability to write to it, and also to interact with it, and incentivization schemas that make sense for your business logic. So I thought we'd actually make a token, and for that, I gave myself 10 minutes, and I think I'm right on the nose, so this is going to be great. But before we do that, are there any questions? Now, I realize that not everyone came with a, a laptop, and what we're going to do is, you know, if you want to play along uh, at home or later, uh, here is a URL. Uh, I basically, and, and this is a funny story about why I wrote this. I, this was a lab that I wrote uh, a little while back. But I, I recently re revamped it. So over summer, I was having a beer in a, in a pub in the UK. It sounds like, almost like a joke, but it really happened. And I thought it'd be so fun with my, my friends that we would go to a blockchain meetup there. And so I, I had no idea. I looked it up, and there it was. There was a blockchain meetup the next day. I said, let's go. It's that pub over there where we can walk across. Let's go have fun, see what it's all about. We walk in, me, Matt, Rupert, Tara, and we doubled the size of the meetup. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great. We started talking. I mean, it was so much fun. We started talking, and this one fellow started talking about their, his ICO. And I thought, wow, this is quite interesting. And so, and I, I said, no, no offense, but you know, you don't seem, you're not the technical one. And he admitted, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm the, the, the CEO, the tech stack person is somewhere else, whatever. And I said, so how are you actually deploying your, your token? Uh, to which he said, well, let me show you this website. And I said, wow, that's crazy. You scroll down, that's me right there. And it happened to be this other uh, uh, project. Now, I, I'm, going, I'm not going to shill, or rather I'm shilling a little bit, but I think it's a free shill. So it's a project I'm a, a, a part of with Proof of Authority Network. Uh, it, you can use it in access. We're going to use the test net for free and, and, and whatnot. Uh, it's still basically a tool that we developed in order for us to create our own token with which to bootstrap our network. Uh, so we basically put this down and we made this into a uh, open source, we put a front end to it. Uh, we used uh, 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 Zeppelin audited contracts. So we are not even using our own contracts. Any developer worth their, their salt will tell you not to do that. You should always use somebody else's software that's been audited, or at the very least formally verified. If you want to talk about formal verification, I can shill some more. <laughs> But um, this, this is basically a front end. And so this, this lab here was, this fellow reached out to me on Telegram. I had no idea who he was. I just saw Orlando Cypher. I, thought, oh. I said, I grew up in Florida. And he said, no, no, I'm the guy you met at the pub. The, the, the thing's broken. We can't get it. We need to get the tokens out today. So I went back to this, this document. I cleaned it up, modernized it, and made it uh, correct. So you could play along at, at home tonight if you like. And, and roll your own ERC-20 token and, and push it out to a network of your choice. You could either push out to the test net, but you could just, when you're doing it, you could just change it to the Ethereum network or any network, really, and it will deploy onto that network, and you will have a token that you can then send to your friends. So I think, since I don't see very many laptops, I think it would be better if we just, should we do it? What do you think? Or I could leave this up, or? How, how, how many people, you know, it, it'll take about 10 minutes, but what we could do is you could do it at home, and I and instead could use a couple of the five minutes we have remaining to answer any questions. 
How about that? How about I leave this up, and if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them about tokens, tokenization, or if you will, you know, how, you know, crypto economics or the, you know, systems level thinking about, yes. Oh, yes. So the question is, what is Byzantine fault tolerance? Or, well, first off, we have to understand the idea of a network of uh, nodes or computers. And let's say we're all trying to understand the current state of the world. And, and to do so, we're going to send messages back and forth. And we're going to say, well, it's raining. And then you, you tell all your friends next to you, hey, it's raining. Now, what if, for some reason, an event occurs in which the messaging technology or the messaging application stack or the ability for us to send messages is interrupted and then all of a sudden one side of the, uh, uh, of the if you will this network can't hear the other side and so we might be saying it's raining outside but the other side says well actually I don't think it's raining what if that fault ever is corrected and then all of a sudden we can now begin to talk to one another again how do we arrive at consensus of the state of the world? How can we say, well, actually, it is raining? Well, that's what Byzantine fault tolerance is, that we've created a system or protocol that allows us to, should we ever become partition, to come back into agreement with reality. And so Bitcoin, and again, I, I say Bitcoin only because it was the first, but we could be talking about blockchain in general, and there are many blockchains now, uh, Bitcoin basically sought to address the Byzantine generals problem. What if you have a network that initially it wasn't under attack, but people like the idea of attack, but rather it's just have faulty notes. You've got one computer just spinning up garbage. Well, how can you say, hey, there's going to be faulty nodes sending out dumb stuff? How can we mitigate that and not tell the rest of the network bad information? How can we say, okay, that's, that's wrong? Let's go with everybody else because that one note is just saying garbage. So Bitcoin sought to address that using this idea of slowing down the network. This was the, a genius move. Slowing down the network so that every node can have enough time to get caught up and say, hey, I think I heard from a lot of friends that it's raining out. <laughs> and Joe over there says it's not raining, but I went and talked to a lot of people in that 10 minutes, and I think it's raining. <laughs> So that, that's the Byzantine general's, you know, problem. And, and I, I short-circuited that terribly, so I... Any other... Yes. Okay, so the question is, so is cons does consensus determine truth? Very elegant, yes. So you might say, well, that's a bold statement, because what if I just have a bunch of nodes and they're all saying gobbledygook and they're saying lies? And that's where the incentivization schemas that you employ and the consensus algorithm you deploy really matter. And that's why I said proof of work is probably the only consensus algorithm that I would trust with cryptocurrencies. It's not to say with blockchain applications. I think there are a lot of consensus algorithms that do not require proof of work because I really think that the true wealth in this technology isn't in cryptocurrency, but the ability to deploy dApps and to run enterprise-grade software atop this new technology. That's where I think the, the real uh, sh you know, wow factor is there. So in essence, yes, but it's complicated. Well, so the question is, and I'll rephrase it. I mean, the question is, well, what if we all just start talking about gobbledygook and, and all of a sudden we're like saying that like up is down and down is up? Well, that's why the coin is so important. And, and the idea of tying economic, and in the case of proof of work, external cost centers into this synthetic environment is so critical. Because you can say anything you want as long as you pay the toll. But you have to pay the toll. And, and if you create a system such, and I, I, I even I said not to talk about shelling points, but if we were to say, all right, we're going to reward the truth. We don't know what the truth is, but we're going to reward the truth. And if you say the truth, you get rewarded. And you go, well, that's awesome, because I'm going to tell everyone to say a lie. 
And then you go, wait a second, do I know everyone? No, I don't. And that's where we get some interesting properties of blockchains. Because right now, you might control your local jurisdiction, right? You might say, hey, I control Fox News, I don't know. But guess what? There's an entire world out there that doesn't belong to that jurisdiction, doesn't care what they say. They, and so you're in a competition with everyone. And if you're going to get a reward based upon the, the if you will, the, the group thought, well, the best way to get your reward is to say, well, let's behave as though we're greedy actors. And so if we want to get rewarded to tell the truth, that's the cheapest route to get rewarded. Oh, but there's another question. So if I can rephrase that maybe, so what, what, what's the uh, advantages of building a token relative to building on top of a coin or is there a particular platform that's better suited for the building of coins? And, and so th th that question uh, really uh, uh, goes at the heart of a lot of questions around current blockchains today. So I said how all of this idea of tokenization really began, at least for me I think, was the idea of colored coins and, and there that was purely on the, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain in which the idea was well if we could take these bits these these bitcoins and then somehow color them or rather tag them or label them well that could act as for example a token uh, however there are some problems with that how do you tell everybody this coin represents a share of stock because that the block the bitcoin uh, coin doesn't have that field to put that data in there so I would have to have another database I'm running and it says, oh yeah, all these coins actually equal these kinds of shares of stock. And there was at some time, believe it or not, uh, uh, Vitalik, when he was writing for Bitcoin Magazine, I mean, really pushed the idea of trying to expand the capabilities of Bitcoin to allow for these novel use cases to emerge. That did not happen, unfortunately. And so what came out of that was Ethereum. Uh, and Ethereum takes a vastly different approach instead of uh, what's known as an unspent transaction output model in which we're just moving these unspent transactions through uh, you know, uh, the system, we're going to do an account-based idea in which we're going to have accounts and these accounts are going to be incremented or, or decremented and we're going to have the ability to have a data field and put information in there. And so now I don't have to tell everyone, oh yeah, yeah, all these coins here actually equal these kinds of tokens or shares of stock, rather the the, co the accounts themselves have that information. And so you don't have to have this uh, more convoluted accounting um, technology. Now, one of the killer apps of Ethereum is tokens. And that's why we've seen so many people building on top of Ethereum various tokens. ERC20, the Ethereum you know, uh, uh, protocol, uh, you know, ERC721, uh, 1501, all of them, Ethereum, 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 in, in my case, even an EVM compatible client. So I would say, yeah, I mean, right now, most people are developing tokens on Ethereum virtual machines because they've been optimized for token creation, whereas other blockchains, not so much. Oh, and then to answer the other question is, so like, what about, uh, you know, why not build directly on the coin? Again, it's just the cost, cent uh, cost factor. If the coin itself is appreciating rapidly relative to the underlying asset, it, it's a terrible unit of account, right? And so it's much better if you could have something else that perhaps is a better unit of account. So it's not changing as dramatically as uh, the underlying uh, coin. And, and, I, and I joked about Ripple creating 38 billion you know, tokens. Now, one of the reasons why they did that, I, they never intended those tokens to ever be used outside of their system. They never intended those to actually be worth anything. So one, if you want to make something worthless, you make a lot of them. <laughs> it was quite by accident that those coins even got, or those tokens, I should say, even got out of the system. In fact, they were one of the first companies to get uh, 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 
uh, uh, actions against them from FinCEN, and they had a six hundred, I think, thousand dollar fine in two thousand fifteen because they 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 had a, a security that was not registered, and they, they never intended that. It just got out by accident. So, well, I think I'm all out of time. So I'd like to give the the uh, uh, mic over to Travis or. And thank you so much. Oh, and you can't see the links, but they're there. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Um, so next we have uh, Travis Herrick um, in his part time. Um, he is actually an instructor at the den as well. Um, but in his uh, actual full time, he is an engineer at Aura. We'll be a couple minutes. No, there's no cell phone. Yeah, this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take this off. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Travis Herrick. I currently work as an instructor for the DEN and I'm here to give a talk on crypto economics. I'm gonna be a little bit more on the crypto side. Uh, I believe uh, Jeff talked about how he doesn't really wanna get into uh, what money is. And that's kind of what my talk is about. So I'm gonna be talking about like what actually is a currency. And, uh, I'm gonna be talking about cryptocurrencies as actual currencies. Um, I think the central thing I wanna be kind of like keeping in mind is I want us to kind of imagine a future where crypto wins. So what does the world look like if, say, all transactions are in a blockchain in 50 years, 100 years, um, and what the world is going to kind of look like? And to kick us off, I'm going to tell two different stories. Um, one is pretty recent, and one is from a few hundred years ago. So um, I'm going to talk about this uh, dude, uh, Laszlo, uh, Laszlo, whose last name I'm not going to pronounce. And Laszlo was the first dude to buy anything with Bitcoin. So he went to the Bitcoin talk forum at the time, the big Bitcoin forum, and he made this post. He's like, hey, I would like to buy some pizza. I like really love pizza. I've got like my two kids, they love pizza. We all like want to have pizza. So I'm gonna give 10,000 Bitcoins and to anyone who can like order a delivery pizza to my house. Um, and there was like a local Papa John's, I believe it was, that you know they went. Some dude called the Papa John's, had two pizzas sent to his house, 100,000 Bitcoins, um, which was worth about two pizzas at the time. Um, this is the first recorded transaction of anyone actually using Bitcoins for anything. Um, so, I believe this is uh, March 22nd, um, somewhere around there, and this is now Bitcoin Pizza Day, where everybody buys Bitcoin with pizza, or buys pizza with Bitcoin. Um, and they actually have interviewed him recently, and he kind of had this attitude, like, hey, I don't regret this at all. Um, and they also interviewed the guy who actually bought, who actually bought the pizzas and received the Bitcoin, and he really didn't regret it at all, of the two of them. Um, so kind of between these two, they basically said like, hey, um, I like got into Bitcoin because I thought it would be like the currency of the future and I just wanted to spend it and I wanted to make these transactions happen. And the guy who, um, and the, the man, I believe it was uh, Jeremy. Jeremy was the guy who actually uh, received this Bitcoin who we then spent on other stuff and like sold off in the meantime. So, and he basically, and Jeremy uh, basically has this quote I'm gonna read. Um, who, who basically did not make a lot of money from that because he ended up selling the coins. But he's like, I never, I've never seen Bitcoin as an investment. And while it's easy to look back and say if I could have been a millionaire, I think it's more important to look in the mindset I had during the pizza transaction. Not being that of acquiring an investment, but making use of a form of currency. 
if I was looking to hoard coins, I very likely wouldn't have been in the, in the right place at the right time anyway. So that's Jeremy, who then received the first transaction of pit, uh, pizza bitcoins and then sold them off for like not very much money. And uh, Leslo actually also didn't really regret anything. He's like, yeah, I don't regret this. Um, I think that it's great that you got to be part of the early history of Bitcoin. And in that way, and people know about the pizza and it's an interesting story because everybody can kind of relate to that. And it's like, oh my God, you like spent all this money on pizza. And you know, I really do hope he had some delicious pizza that night. But uh, it is a lot of money if he would have held it. And I'm sure he like kicks himself a little bit. Um, so that's my first story. Um, and the second story is from like uh, a little bit like longer ago. Um, this is back in 1637. And uh, I want to talk about the Dutch, and we're going to talk about tulips. Um, and at the time, tulips, I believe, had been imported from uh, the east, I believe, like somewhere in Asia at the time. Um, and tulips were like super popular. So some things were happening, in, uh, happening with the Dutch at the time. Um, one of the things is these tulips they were getting were specifically, um, so some things about tulips. So tulips are flowers you plant on the ground. Um, when we talk about tulip trading, we're going to talk about they traded the actual bulbs. So we get a tulip seed, to be, for it to become a flower, it takes like seven to 12 years, the entire process. So tulips like take a very, very long time. And this, like, these bulbs are somewhat durable, you can hold on to them. Um, also, there was this uh, virus that they had, which is the mosaic virus. And the mosaic virus is like the reason tulips have all these colors and different levels of virus you'd have. So you had to, without knowing what a virus was at the time, have these like viral tulips um, and then everyone is like, these are like the best like flowers ever. Everyone decided that they wanted to buy them. Um, at the time, there was also the beginning of like the futures trade. So what would happen is I would want to buy my tulips from the tulip farmers, and it'd be like seven years before I got my flowers, and anyone cared. So people are trading on these tulips that are going to exist in the future. Um, so what happened is you had this huge mania. Uh, prices shot up. Uh, it, it, it's at the height, I believe, if you're like a laborer at the time, uh, some sort of craftsman, it took about 40 uh, years of your labor to buy one tulip. That was like the going rate. So it was like obscene, like nobody could, like obviously this is not sustainable at all, and it collapsed. Um, side note, at the time in Amsterdam, I believe, um, the, uh, there's a bubonic plague where all this was going on. So there's like some historical speculation that like people were very willing to make risky investments because hey, Plague's going on right now, and it's like not very good anyway, so we're gonna kinda go with this. Um, and there was, and, and, and because, so, so I think it was, uh, tulips could change hands up to 10 times a day, is how fast they were going. So these, so these goods are never being shipped, people are just trading this huge uh, menu. Um, so that could be a metaphor for Bitcoin, that's not exactly where I'm going with this, but, um, Bitcoin does have this property of like people started buying in to um, get this currency and a lot of people bought the currency in order to make money. Um, there's a side note that uh, we're all in the blockchain space, or a lot of us are. Um, Bitcoin actually does have value. Um, tulips have about a flower's worth of value. Bitcoins are a monetary financial instrument that might change the world and make us all like very rich and happy down the line. Um, so that I'm, I'm not, but one of these things does have to be true. Um, either we have our pizza friends who see Bitcoin as a currency and they have a bunch of Bitcoin, they have to spend it immediately. Or we end up in a situation where everyone's just buying Bitcoin to kind of hold on to it and the price is going to shoot up and we're kind of going to look at this world that looks more like tulips. And we kind of can't have both. Um, and the rest of my talk is mostly about like why that is and like what money looks like. But the problems with what some of the initial reasons people are buying the crypto might not be the most healthy things long term for the space. Um, so we're going to talk about what money is, which I said I would get into. So uh, hopefully this is like going to be a little bit interesting. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, some hunter, when we had hunter-gatherer tribes. Um, one of the earliest forms of money um, are like she sell beads, like beads um, with like snail shells and that sort of thing. And we have like find these, they're like 30,000 years old, right? Like extremely like old money. Um, and there's also lots of like either ceremonial weapons or like uh, objects that took lots of time to craft um, that were used to uh, basically trade for food or foraging rights between like pre-agricultural tribes. And this is sort of similar to proof of work where it's valuable because it takes like six months to make this like pretty thing. Um, so we had like a lot of like simple currencies like this and they tend to be very local. 
um, we had kind of, we had a lot of like uh, beat systems for a lot of like early cultures that sort of tracked like public ledgers for who would what. Um, and we kind of had that system for a while. Um, after agriculture, after like larger civilizations, we end up being metal money. So if most of the history of money has been just like gold and precious gold and silver. Um, and these are tend to be relatively stable. We tend to have some growing because you can mine it, but somewhat like limited supply of gold that we use as money or like other metals at the time. Um, and these tended to be issued by governments um, or uh, universally done by governments. Um, a small story here. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Spain. And Spain actually had the uh, gold standard when they discovered the new world. And there is, <coughs> and what they did is they came and they like mined a bunch of gold in like South America and stole money from the natives and brought it back. And what happened with Spain, and when we talk about, um, is they brought all this gold back. Their economy crashed because they had hyperinflation. This is like gold, way too much gold, same amount of stuff, it became useless. And the wealth of nations, a lot of like Adam Smith, a lot of capitalism was a direct response to Spain doing this and saying like, hey, this is not a good idea. This is like not how money works. So a lot of money supply and a lot of that theory came out of like this like hyperinflation of like gold, um, which I'm going to get a lit bit down on gold a bit. But um, and then, but we, we, what they eventually that stabilized and we used that for like a few decades um, or several centuries. And now we have like paper money. So paper money um, has been last like 150 years has been like the main source of money we're doing. And we've officially gone off like attaching that to gold sometime in the 70s. Um, and what's interesting about these like more modern forms of money is when we have either paper money or we have like metal based money. These are very trust based systems. Um, and I mean trust directly to talk about how we talk about Bitcoin being trustless. Um, so by trust-based systems, like when we use dollars, we're using dollars because we trust that these have value. We trust that other people think these have value. We trust that our government thinks that these have value. Um, and this is kind of one of the main concerns when we talk about cryptocurrencies, which we're going to talk about more in a bit. But um, for cryptocurrencies, we want to remove this like need to trust somebody else to hold a store of value for the currencies that we're using. So for... Um, Bitcoin in particular, we want to be able to just trust this like overall system that people are participating in, but we don't want to have to trust like an individual actor, right? Because the government is like completely capable of say printing as much money as they want. Um, we have some like token systems where it'd be very concerning if say a company issues a token, and that company can just print as many of that token whenever they want and give themselves it, and then your money is now worthless. Um, so with all our old monetary systems, like we do have this implicit trust, and one of the things that crypto can do is like it can allow the system to be the source of trust rather than an individual who is, of course, selfish. So when we talk about like economic designs of crypto systems, it's a lot of like what we care about. Um, and then in 2008, August, after some financial problems in the world that year, um, we did have Satoshi come out. He came up with Bitcoin, and he came up with this economic system of what we c what the future of currencies could be like. Um, and I'm going to just kind of talk about this a bit. Um, I'm not really going to talk about like the technical. Uh, I can talk about the technical implementation of Bitcoin very much, but I do want to talk about like some of its properties. So, um, who here like is in the crypto space or has like owned money, be uh, who owned cryptocurrency, or has been interested in this for a while? All right. Um, so what, what what got you into crypto? Like, uh, if I can put you on the spot a bit. Yeah, and I think um, anyone, anyone else? Anyone else get in? Anything else that like got people into crypto systems in the first place? Oh, yeah, Jeff, I'll get you. <laughs>
right? And uh, I think, and I'll, I'll ask you a bit more, but I, I know I'm going to go uh, in and out in some of the ways that sometimes cryptocurrencies can have some issues going in the future, but I do want to talk about like how great like Bitcoin itself is and how great like the crypto t cryptocurrencies are in general and what their promise is. Um, I think the big thing is like we do have like a bit of, hey, there was some big government failures and big economic failures and um, societal-wide failures that weren't really addressed properly. Um, one of the big things we see that people are using, when people use Bitcoin for day-to-day -day transactions, a lot of people in uh, Venezuela particularly, which outlawed the ownership of gold at the time, I believe, um, is sometimes the government is out to get you and society is adversarial and, you do, and Bitcoin does allow um, a defense against that because you can't be an outside system you can't be an individual in Bitcoin who has control over it, and you can't be an outside. You can't be an outside entity that comes and takes control of it. So there's freedom aspects. There is uh, anonymous payments got a lot of people excited. Um, we have kind of new things we can invent. So say everything on Ethereum is definitely in the category of what's a new financial instrument and what is a new way of doing things that we could not have imagined in, in say 2005. Um, we have privacy concerns. We have uh, micropayments. Hopefully, if you get something that's very performant in the future, we could see like very small payments being done on the blockchain. We have different issuance. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about inflation later. Um, but we could say, where does the if we have to add money into the economy, who does that go to, and who can we help that? Who can that go to besides say like a bank or a government? Where can that money go? So there's a lot of things that cryptocurrency promises, and I think the core thing that it promises is. With cryptocurrencies, we can do things that were impossible before we created them. And if cryptocurrency is the future of our money, how that works is we may have fundamentally different ways and of dealing with transactions in the future. So that is kind of the promise of what cryptocurrency can be and like the promise of like what it is. We also talked a bit about uh, Bitcoin. Is so Bitcoin is deflationary currency. Um, we, I said I'm not get a little bit too technical, but when new blocks are discovered in Bitcoin, you give some amount of new coins that now exist that did not before to the person who discovers that block. And the amount of coins that person gets goes down over time. Um, so there's a finite number of Bitcoins that can ever exist. So at some point it becomes zero, I think, at, towards the end of the century, something like that. And uh, that means that there's only so many Bitcoins that can ever exist. And those Bitcoins, if, as we want to imagine a world where Bitcoin is the only money in the future, there's only so, such percentage of the economy each Bitcoin can possibly represent. Which, when the economy grows, that just means that the value of Bitcoin has to grow because you own some percentage of all the money in the world. Um, deflationary, so and deflation is kind of a dangerous thing. So. Ethereum was also inflationary, so we'll get into that, but um, you will eventually get either to the tulip situation or sometimes, uh, say, the Bitcoin crash situation, where the reason people buy Bitcoin is because the price will go up. And if the price isn't stable, what happens is most people are not buying Bitcoin to circulate it. So the pizza guy is like doing what is healthy for the economy, it's buying things with Bitcoin. If, you're like a tulip person, you're just holding on to this value. Yes, it's going to go up, but like somebody's at the end of that. And the reason to buy is a hoard and not spend it. So you end up with not a currency, you might end up with something like how people buy gold today, something like that. But you don't have like a true like day-to-day -day transaction um, system. You're not, you're not going to go to like the supermarket and buy bread with like stocks you have in the stock market, you're gonna do that with money. Um, so I kind of worry that if Bitcoin is primarily investment, it loses a lot of the other things that it can be. It becomes very hard for it to be like a day-to-day -day currency, and it becomes very hard for it to be um, good for anonymous transactions, good for other, the other promises that it has. Um, so, uh, inflation is also very bad. You have Venezuela, I mentioned. They have very bad hyperinflation. Um, I happen to have 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollars at home right now, which I got from a friend. It's, they went from like having, um, I think, like some reasonable number of dollars to basically a very, very high amount of inflation over a very short period of time. You can buy bricks of 10 trillion dollar bills from that t time. 
um, for like $5 on eBay, something like that. Um, so if your money has no value, now you can't buy anything, and now like your labor doesn't really have value, and a lot of what made money works breaks down. Um, so fundamentally, what you need is you need some sort of way to make the price of your cryptocurrency stable. So if we imagine like a cryptocurrency future, one where we're like all using crypto for most of our lives, what does that look like? And it means that we can't really have the systems that we have now. We need something a little bit different. We're going to need something um, either stable or with some like small level of inflation or deflation. So there's going to be kind of a small, um, safe Goldilocks area that we can have our money be. And I, we don't currently have controls on what that is. And this is very reasonable. Bitcoin isn't really meant the rules that Bitcoin has are mostly designed to get it adopted, or the cryptocurrency that survive right now are mostly hoping to get adopted quickly. And we're not really building as a community cryptocurrencies that are designed to be the entire world. Uh, because that's not likely within the next like 20 years. Uh, maybe in the next 50 it becomes much more likely. So the timing of the decisions that we're doing, like what matters is not necessarily what that looks like, but I do think it's important to know that it does need to change at some point if we want to get to a future that is crypto-centric. And we can imagine either stable coins are really care about this. Stable coins want to um, peg their value to the dollar right now. Um, in the future, we're probably looking for coins that really want to peg their value to say some sort of like physical good or some kind of like index of goods in the economy. Um, we could have several competing blockchains that themselves. So if we're very likely to see if we tokenize say um, real estate Something that's really like they do, we tokenize other like financial assets, we tokenize like other goods, those may compete in some stable Nash equilibrium that we can imagine. Um, or other things like that. So I think the core thing that I want to leave is that um, the current kind of design of crypto is more as an investment tool, doesn't really work as a currency itself. But there's a lot of things that cryptocurrencies do that our money doesn't do now, that we can sort of design towards that as time goes on. Um, and I think that is the main thing I want to leave you guys with. Um, I do have some time for questions, though, um, if anyone wants to go over anything. Yeah? Um, I think some could be, right? Um, so we have... So I think the idea of stable coins is you're adjusting the supply of money based on, say, the dollar, right? Most of them want to pay themselves the dollar currently because they aren't the only thing in the world, right? Um, most people use dollars for most transactions, and it's the most stable, one of the most stable currencies. Um, in the future, if we're all on crypto, all on blockchains, if all our money is on blockchains, it doesn't really work very well. So something like real estate or something that is likely to be tokenized um, may be a safer thing to use as a proxy for like the economy. Yeah. Um, well, I can I'll go a bit into this. So you want your money to be growing about the rate of stuff that you build, right? So if you imagine like say food's the only thing that you could ever want is like pizzas are the only good. Um, if we double our production, we want to have about twice the money supply, so we don't get into the deflation or inflation problem, right? Um, we don't want a situation where our money is becoming better over time, so we never spend it, because that leads to like really bad problems because nobody buys anything. And if you have inflation, like your money's worthless, so you stop using it because you just won't use your money, right? Does that make it, does that make sense? Do you feel like your question has been answered? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, what, I, what I meant is uh, I think real estate is likely to be tokenized because we talk about tokenizing like items, right? And like having non-fungible tokens. And I think one of the things that would be tokenized in the future would be real estate because it makes lots of sense, right? Like only one person can own real estate. You can have a public ledger of who owns it. It makes sense to do that because it's um, one global place. So I think like things that blockchains would make sense if they were worldwide adopted include real estate, but that might not necessarily where you want to peg your entire economy to. That makes sense. All right, I think.
that's all I have to say. Um, but I'll be around, and yeah. Once again, guys. Ah. Once again, guys, can we get one more round of applause for Jeff and Can we get one more round of applause for Travis? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Uh, once again, uh, if you're an existing software engineer and you're trying to become a blockchain developer, uh, please come talk to us afterwards. Uh, otherwise, if you have any other blockchain-related questions, we're more than happy to come and answer them. And next week, uh, and who's speaking? We have Link from Decent. From Decentral Solutions, we have Link. Uh, and then we also have, uh, we have just, just please just continue. Uh, okay. So we have one person who, who is still to be confirmed, and we have one person from Decentral Solutions called Link, and they're going to be talking about digital identity next week, same time at 7 o'clock over here at Hacker Dojo. All right, thank you guys.